who are joining us. Um, apologies for the late, you know, start. Uh, it was just due to a lot of technical difficulties that we were having over our side. Um, apologies for that. And also just thank you, big thank you for joining us in um, this conversation. So today's conversation is looking at um, SMMEs um, Financing 101, particularly. Um, so what we're trying to figure out is how do we foster, um, you know, a much more accessible and a much more quicker um, financial access for small businesses in South Africa? And how does that look like from an entrepreneur side and also from, you know, enterprise development and financial institutions in South Africa? And also, what is the role that, um, you know, the government, or what can the government, what role what role can the government play um, in ensuring that small businesses do have access to um, financial to financial institutions and to um, financial um, financial health. So joining me in conversation is um, Kenlyn Stride, who is Managing Director at Transformation Africa Architects. Um, Don Mashelele, who I believe is running behind schedule or maybe in the waiting room, we'll see if we'll be able to get in touch with him. He is Head of Development from um, CFA, Head of Development Impact support at CEFA. CEFA is um, Small Enterprise and Finance Agency. And we have Bojime Latswane, who is Managing Director at OnPoint Healthcare. And lastly, Titi Morate, who, Mar Marote, is that, did I pronounce that fine? Marote, yeah. Um, from Guardian Health, um, co-founder of Guardian Health and um, data scientist at Terraflow. Welcome to my panel and thank you for your time and thank you for joining me um, in this conversation. It's quite a broad one. It's quite a big one. Um, and I know when I, as I was preparing for the conversation today, I was just thinking there's just a lot that can be spoken about in terms of financial access for small businesses in South Africa. And how does that look like? And how does the landscape look like, actually, you know, from the Vukuzenzele days when, you know, that initiative sort of came in and up until now where, you know, 4IR has been integrated into our society, you know, in digital landscape as well, what is the role of, SS of SMMEs and do they have access to even digital resources, never mind financial resources. So as I said, it's quite a big conversation. We're going to try and narrow it down to just um, financial institutions that are available that help SMMEs. Also try and investigate, as mentioned, the government's role in providing support for SMMEs and also look at some of the financial literacy frameworks um, that can ensure SMMEs are financially healthy. And also just from the SMME side, um, you know, what were some of, what have been some of the experiences, um, you know, in trying to garner financial support and financial health for their small businesses. Kenlyn, I'm gonna start with you because you are in the enterprise development space. Um, you work with numbers, with small businesses. I want to ask, um, you know, as I mentioned, there's been quite a, you know, struggle with finances for small businesses in South Africa. And it's, it's quite a weird one because GDP um, contributions from South Africa as many as, you know, amount to like 39%, which makes, which make them kind of like a critical engine for our our, our economy, but then at the, in the same breath, there seems to be a gap in SMMEs having access to financial health. Now, you know, with that struggle to access finance, um, and I do think maybe part of that problem is access to information. Um, how do we bridge the gap to access to information? Before we talk about getting to the point where you ask for money, but just in terms of information, how do we bridge that gap? Yeah, um, thank you so much for that. Um, firstly, let me apologize for the black and white screen. I'm not too sure what Zoom is doing to me, but I promise I'm a lot more colorful <laughs> in real life. Um, so first things first, uh, when it comes to the information around entrepreneurship, around gaining access to finance, it is something that's a bit of a mystery. And honestly, before I even uh, got into this space, I did not even know that this particular space existed. So that speaks volumes in itself. I think that government puts aside tons of funds um, for entrepreneurship. I think that so do banks. Corporates have a uh, responsibility to also finance businesses. But the problem here is finding the right entrepreneur. So even when you do gain access to that information, you see that, oh, there's a fund available. Um, the bank offers me this particular product. It is a situation of these corporates, these entities being able to feel a sense of trust to actually finance entrepreneurs because 
there's this misconception of, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur and I started last night. So why would I as a corporate entity or as a government entity fund you? Um, so I think that more than anything, it's not really the access to information because I think that there is, you'll gain access to it. You'll gain access to some information. All you really need is one particular vehicle. But I think more than anything else is changing that uh, uh, misconception that uh, entrepreneurs in South Africa, in particular Africa, are fly-by-nights or chances. Yeah, it's my take on it. I see that um, Bobo Don Machelele has been able to join us and you were actually going to, this question was going to be for you and Kenya. So um, I'm just going to give it to you as you just join in. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick background on, you know, what we've just touched on so far. So, so far, I've just given a bit of a, a bit of context um, in terms of the SMME landscape in South Africa. Um, I know, as I mentioned when I was introducing you, um, that you are Head of Development Impact Support at CEFA, that is um, Small Enterprise small enterprise and finance agency. And the question that I posed to Ken Lin was that um, seeing that SMMEs are struggling to access to finance, to get access to finance. And I sort of noted that I think maybe the problem is getting the right information. Ken Lin is saying that the information is there, but there's just a trust issue. Um, from your side then, as someone who works in this space as well, I think you, the both of you are sort of in the enterprise development space. From your side, um, do you agree that the problem is not necessarily information, but it's also just trusting that um, the, the SMMEs that are coming into the, the playground are also not fly by nights, as Kellen has mentioned, but also quite um, stable businesses that are just looking for that support. Uh, thanks, thanks, Apir, for, for the opportunity and apologies for, for, for joining late. Um, I, I think from, from our side as a CIFA, we're a, we're a lender, we're a development funding institution. And it's more of a combination uh, because what we do find is SMMEs, when they want to, or entrepreneurs, should I put it that way, if you want to start or you want to expand a business or you want to purchase a business, the first thing that you ask yourself is where can I get funding? Uh, and there are a lot of things that need to happen before you can approach a lender for funding. So there's a lot of pre-loan assistance that our applicants need before they can approach the likes of CIFA and, and be funding ready. So funding readiness is, is a problem. Uh, and when you come to CIFA and then we ask one or two questions and say, we can't help you because of X, Y, Z, it's not that you are not a good entrepreneur as it were, but it's because you know, funding comes down the line. You know, it's not the first thing that you need to be thinking of. There's, there's a lot of things that you need to think of in terms before you can approach uh, any land. It can be a DFI, it can be a bank. So what 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 is not there uh, and it creates a bit of frustration for, for lenders and, and, and entrepreneurs alike, it's a proper clearinghouse. You know, a proper clearinghouse where you can say, listen to all the aspirations of entrepreneurs, prepare them to be funding ready. So once they are funding ready, then you know exactly what the, the lenders are looking for and, and present those proposals for, to, to the lenders or uh, for, 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 for assistance. So if I give you um, statistics without giving numbers, but percentages, out of the, uh, let's say as a CIFA, we actually approve, I would say, uh, less than 10% of the inquiries that we get. So that means, therefore, if you are approached by 100 entrepreneurs at the inquiry phase, whether they want to start a business, whether they want to expand a business, the success rate is that it's less than 10%. Out of 100, the ones that you can approve and disperse and support, it will be 10. Then that tells you that the 90, it doesn't make them bad. It means, therefore, they need assistance before they can come to a lender. So that's why I argue that you need a proper clearinghouse we, we are we're actually getting there because we are now working with CEDA, our sister organization, uh, to be that clearinghouse, to be that institution that will say, if you are looking for funding, let's check and ensure that you've got everything that is requested or that will be required by lenders, you know, both private and, 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 and public sector, before you can approach them for funding. Because if you don't do that, it frustrates you as an entrepreneur 
you know, and, and, and actually it, it creates a, 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 a panic in the system. So my argument is that over and above the trust issues uh, that Kendi is talking about, I'll argue that the most fundamental challenge gap that we don't have uh, is a proper clearinghouse. Yeah, let me pause there. Um, before you pause, I do want to ask, as you mentioned, um, you mentioned funding readiness. And I think, um, again, that speaks to information. How, as a small business, as an entrepreneur, um, entrepreneur, do I sort of get access to what it is exactly the requirements for funding readiness? And how does that look like for my small business or for whatever um, entity I run? Okay. So... What, what, what we have done, maybe let me step back and say, because the issue of funding readiness, you, you need to create a form of an ecosystem. And in an ecosystem, that is where you've got a lot of funders uh, under one roof in quotes, you know, so that entrepreneurs don't know. I mean, they don't know exactly. They know what they're looking for, but they don't know what CFS is offering. They don't know what IDC is offering. They don't know what Standard Bank, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a portal called FinFind. Uh, maybe some of the people in the platform you'll know about FinFind. So FinFind is a portal that has got a number of lenders in the country. So it's not only CIFA, it's not only your DFIs, it's quite a number of lenders. Uh, so the portal is designed in such a way that as a CIFA, if I use that example, we have given our requirements. So you you, you, you give your, your, your eligibility and qualifying criteria to say, if you're an entrepreneur, for you to qualify for CIFA funding, you'll need one, two, three, four, and five. So that portal has got that information. So it's built around that. And like I said, and emphasize, it's not only DFS, it's not only CIFA, it's got quite a number of lenders. So what you do, you just go www.finfind.co.za. And then what it will do, the portal will ask you, it's a pre-screening portal. It will ask you very basic questions about your business. What is it that you want to do, et cetera, et cetera. So once you have responded to that portal, it will take about what, 10, 15 minutes uh, on average. Once you have responded accurately and given the accurate information about your business to say you're done, you wanna, you're looking for 10, 10, 10 million rent to do X, Y, Z, you've got so many employees, et cetera, et cetera. Now, at the end of that portal, what it will do then, it will give you possible lenders. You know, it will shift from the number of lenders that are there in the portal. If, for instance, they've got 200 potential lenders, it will then say, from how you've responded to the portal, uh, your, your proposal can potentially be assessed by this, the following institutions. That will give you a list, maybe it will be 10 institutions. Then you know that you've narrowed your search. You have narrowed your search from a myriad of lenders that are there in the country, and you, you it will give you a list of few that could potentially uh, look at your proposal. So, so that is the one way of saying out of the a bigger market there of providers of capital, you know, and, and you you are you are, you are on, the, on, on the demand side, then where do you go and how do you get there? So that that that, that that's that, that's the portal thing. What we have done at CIFA. We have white labeled FinFind for us. So if you go as an entrepreneur, you 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 look into our website. It will there's a there's a link that says apply for finance. So it will ask you basic questions about your business, like I said. And then at the end of it all, if you answer positively in terms of our eligibility eligibility criteria, it will then say, okay, now you are eligible to apply for CIFA funding, it will give you a form that you need to complete. So what it does, it's more like creating an online clearinghouse, like I was arguing that you need a clearinghouse, but it's there online, it's created. It's not as perfect because we've just done it recently. I think last year we did that. But again, it, it's assisting in a big way because if you are not eligible to apply for CIFA funding, don't even try because if you complete a form, give us documents at the end of it, no, we say no. You know, it's, it's, it's frustrations all over the place. So, so that, that, that is that, we have created what I would argue is an online ecosystem of lenders in the country. And if you're an entrepreneur out there and you need to, you don't know where to go, FinFind is the right place to go. Uh, you can also come through our website, you'll still get the same assistance. Uh, if CIFA cannot assist you, for instance, 
as a CIFA, we provide funding under direct lending up to a maximum of 15 million. So if you come to us and say, I'm looking for 20 million as an example, it will then say you are not eligible to apply for CIFA funding. However, you can approach this other DFIs. It could be the NEF, it could be the IDC, the land bank, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thank, thank you so that. much for that. I think that is quite insightful. That was quite insightful information for entrepreneurs out there. Now I want to switch it a bit and go to the two entrepreneurs um, in the in, in, in the panel. And I just then want to pose the same question, but now to you, Cici and Boitumelo, I think I would like to hear from the journey side of things when you were thinking you want to create this kind of entity. And I think coincidentally, both of you have um, uh, uh, um, have enterprises that are within the the health space. Um, what sort of um, what sort of measures did you take, or what was the journey? What what did the journey look like for you guys when you um, were sort of looking for funding to start your respective um, entities? Um, I'll start with you, Boyd Mel. Okay, thank you so much, Akine, and thank you for the glitch. Um, I think. Uh, you know, looking back on my entrepreneurial journey, I've, I'm sure they have summarized all the challenges that we encounter as entrepreneurs. And you've highlighted one of them, access to information, access to networks, which was a challenge for me, and access to markets, and the funding which was highlighted, and also the payment issues that we encounter as a small player. I mean, if you're paid in 90 days, your cash flow is so impacted and your overall, overall service offering is actually impacted. But I think what has uh, managed to kind of sustain me or keep me um, above board, which has been quite challenging, has been a, a really, really tough journey. Um, when I started off, none of the uh, commercial banks wanted to touch me. Yes, none of them. That's fine. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> Is. So, 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 so none of them would touch me. I, and I articulated my business so well in the business plan. I think I prepared it myself. So I understood what I was getting into. And especially, I mean, I'm in the pharmacy uh, industry. It's a very niche sector. It, it requires speciality. So, I mean, none of them wanted to touch me. So I ended up going into family and dipping uh, my pockets deep into my financial resources. I mean, pension fund that I had credit cards that I had, I basically depleted everything. But it was a positive lesson in that, um, in packaging my service offering, um, because I did not have much to go with, I sold a product that the market received well. Hence, over time, because it was so well received, it was, you know, the, the product, the pharmacy, it was in a, it was in a, a community area and medical center, it was so well received, it was a need that was needed that once they, and our service levels was, were on par. So once I you know, started gaining the confidence, my business started uh, picking up, then the commercial entity said, now we can sit down and talk. We can offer you an overdraft, we can offer you a loan, but you really, really, really have to articulate your vision very well. And you really have to know the in and out of your industry because our healthcare industry, as I stated, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a speciality on its own. So, and I began identify enterprise uh, development um, funding within the, the, the healthcare industry, which uh, because it's aligned to what I do, I felt that when I go to companies that are in the healthcare industry, they are more receptive and we speak the same language. So that's, that's, that's where I've kind of strategized and how to um, draw resources for my business in order to sustain myself. But I constantly have to review and revise my product offering. So it's an interesting journey. It's, 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 you have to be passionate about it. It's not easy, but it's possible. Sisi, um, you know, Boitimelo touches on a lot of difficulties and, and I think it's, it's quite evident in, in, in pretty much almost all entrepreneurial stories is that, you know, the beginning is quite, it's quite eventful financially, um, you know, it's quite a struggle to also be a successful player when there's a bit of a insecurity, you know, in, in finances and networking, as Boitimelo mentioned, which I think is also quite a very vital component of a business. Um, on your side with um, Guardian Health, what was what was your journey in, in trying to acquire financial accessibility and financial assistance? 
Um, so our our journey was quite different, I would say. So what, what actually happened is, so our business is in health, yes, but it is a health tech company. So we actually build technology for the health sector. Um, very specific though, uh, to a very specific niche market. So what actually happened was because we are tech people, we built the product um, and we didn't really look for, so what, what happened is we didn't sit down and say, okay, we, we have a business idea. So we're gonna go out there and look for funding to start the business because we had the skill that was needed to build the platform. What we did is we started to build the platform and we started to compete with the product. So we actually went to various competitions and we competed with the product. And as we were winning with the product, we were actually raising money. So if we go to a competition and we get a hundred thousand rand, that's money that's coming into the business. So that's how we raised money. We've actually never gone out and and done any, not well, we've, we've engaged with investors, just for that process to understand how the process works. But we're not really open to that as yet because the money that we've actually raised was able to sustain us because to build, we could actually run the business with the skills that we had. I mean, of course, as the business starts to grow, that's when you realize that you now need, you know, various other skills more than the tech. Now we need, you know, legal people. Now we need um, people in accounting and stuff like that. So that's where I guess the money then comes into play where you're like, okay, now we have the product, we have the consumers, um, but now we need to actually have more money to, so I guess we're still going there, but for us, it's been raising money using the skills and the product that we had. I like that because you also bring in a different perspective because um, I, I guess from, a, from, from an outsider who's just, um, I, I guess, just a spectator, um, just looking at the entrepreneurial world from an outside, it, it can seem as if the journey can, yes, it will have it, its differences purely because, you know, businesses are unique, but I think you bring in a very nice perspective in terms of also an alternative way of getting funding, which might not be similar for you know different businesses or for more traditional businesses, but I think um, it, it it leaves us with something to think about in terms of also just um, you know thinking about raising funds in different ways of selling your business because that also might be a contributor to uh, um, to at least um, funding or financial access. I'm going to take it back to Ubabu um, Mashalela and Kenlin. Um, so. Again, small media enterprises contribute, um, I think the stats showed um, this year or last year rather, roughly 1.5 trillion to our gross domestic um, product, yet uh, government puts a fraction of this um, back into the sector, which doesn't really, the amount of money that you know the government puts back into the landscape doesn't move the dial. Um, I think then, just from an enterprise development perspective, what can the government do more to enable access um, to funding for SMEs? And I know you know, Bob Mashalela just gave us a, a, a thorough sort of um, uh, uh, um, you know requirements and 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 measures that can be taken from the entrepreneur side. But I think you know as government, obviously, they do also have a, a role in ensuring that funding is accessible. With that, with that in the backdrop. What can the government do more to enable access to funding for SMEs? Okay, thanks. If I may, can, can, can I link your question, uh, Apiwe, to what you have asked the entrepreneurs in terms of the journey? Because it, mm -hmm. it, actually, it actually linked somewhat. Um, because what, what do you think in terms of the entrepreneurial journey? Uh, some of the DFIs or lenders, they are equipped, if I may put it that way, to support SMEs once they have proven that what they have works. You know, uh, the, the interventions that we have, both private and, and, and public, most of that is debt funding. And debt funding then means that we can assist you as an entrepreneur because now you are ready to go to market, you have proven yourselves, et cetera, et cetera. So that becomes an easier deal to fund because it's ready to enter the market. Now, um, in, in, in the era that we are at now, uh, we, we, we need to be supporting a lot of startup businesses as well because the, the situation out there has changed. I mean, COVID amongst other things, it has forced us to reset the economy not only in South Africa, but I think internationally. You know, there are certain businesses, uh, whether I would like it or not, uh, may not come back. I mean, 
let's uh, truth be told. And there are certain businesses that see opportunity that will be born and called through this, 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 this period that we're at. So I think now the, the focus should be, let's look at how we can better support startup businesses. Because there are those businesses now that will see an opportunity and they'll start for one reason or the other. Now, startup businesses are, are difficult to fund if what you have is debt funding. You know, I think it was Victor Melo was saying that when she started a business, she had to go and uh, get money from family, friends, et cetera, et cetera. So those are people that believe in your idea. And what they're giving you is not debt. Well, they may not call it that, but it's equity. You know, that's where we now, the difference between debt and equity. Now, those are equity investors who come and say, we will invest in your business because we believe in your idea. Now, we uh, as state DFIs, if I may argue, we don't have a lot of equity instruments. You know, because equity instruments, that is where uh, a lot of people have got ideas, you know, come with as an ideation phase. You can't fund an idea through that. It's not going to be practical because you need cash flows if you want to use that. Um, so someone has got an idea, good idea. We need to identify those ideas and properly support them through the right instrument. And like I argue, it could be a equity, it could be a combination of a loan and a grant, whatever the case is, but we need patient capital at that phase of a business. So after the ideation, you must go, before you can even enter the market, you need to prove your concept, you know, what you call proof of concept. You know, uh, this is much more, I think, uh, popular in the, in the, tech, in the, tech, in the uh, tech space, if I may say. But now also in that proof of concept, again, that may not be an ideal instrument. So you still need someone who will come with patient capital, someone who would believe you knew um, because they're investing equity in the business. So to get a lot of businesses off the ground, if you were to respond to a question, what can be done? I think we need to now start saying, what kind of instruments do you have to tailor for different phases of businesses being the journey and different sectors because the sectors will never be the same. So it cannot be a once, one size fits all. And uh, if, if, if I may put it to you without going to detail, we, uh, we as CIFA, when I say we, I mean the Department of Small Business Development together with its two agencies, CIFA and CEDA, because we work as a portfolio, we do have a lot of instruments, you know, that have been developed, you know, during, I think we started last year, uh, when COVID hit, we had to go back to the drawing board and say, we can't miss this good opportunity, as our minister likes to say, that, you know, when there's a crisis, there's also an opportunity, and you, kind of, you cannot lose that. So we developed a number of instruments. Uh, we just don't have time now to go through each one of those instruments. But those instruments, what are they saying? Those are the instruments where we are saying we need now, as I said, COVID, the, the, the challenge that, or the opportunity that we, we was presented by COVID is for us to reset the economy. So the instruments that we have, these are the instruments where we are saying there are businesses in townships, there are businesses in rural areas, how do we better support those businesses? And we've got programs that are called Township uh, Rural and Empowerment Programs, the TREP programs, where we are packaging um, initiatives for each and every sector of a business in the township and in a rural area. Because remember now, uh, before that, what, we, what used to happen is, we will say there is a township economy there is rural development, but we didn't give ourselves enough time to then ask ourselves the question, what kind of businesses are there in those spaces in township and rural areas? So the programs that I'm talking about now, these are dedicated programs, for instance, uh, that will support spaza shops. So we've got a dedicated program that supports spaza shops, because that's our reality. Spaza shops are there in township and rural areas, and we cannot and leave them out and then provide the normal funding that we have. It may not work for that sector. So we've got those trap programs, like I said, in the interest of time, I won't go through each one of them. But with a sponsor shop support program, as an example, we've got programs that support businesses in, uh, in textile. We've got uh, and clothing industry. We've got the, the ones that support your, your uh, cooked foods, you know, 
we've got those type of programs, uh, personal care, um, uh, you know, the health saloons, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got close to eight, um, if, I'm not, if my, my memory serves me well, eight to nine programs, and also some in the manufacturing space. Because again, one of the things around the issue of COVID is to then say, we need to rethink the, the value chain. Now we need now to start localizing our manufacturing uh, because you know when the, the logistics internationally products are no longer moving as they used to move before, you know, it then starts saying that you need to start developing your local economy. You know, you cannot forever be relying on getting imports for things that you can develop yourself locally. So we've got a small um, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, program that, that we, we do have. That is the program where it's a combination of a grant and a loan and we support SMMEs to the maximum of 15 million to then say, let's give a combination of a grant and a loan and you and manufacturing will assist you. So in a nutshell, the moral of the, of the story, I'm saying that we have started doing that, but we need to do more of blended finance programs than just do debt funding because debt funding has got its base, but you also need blended finance where you combine a grant and a loan in one package and you can assist a lot of businesses. Then, and um, Mashalela brings a new perspective or a different perspective, um, saying one, the issue is not probably more what the government could do more, but it's also just about looking at different avenues to support um, different businesses. Um, from your side, as someone who's worked in enterprise development in the private sector, um, when you're looking at the government and some of the measures that have been taken by the government, um, are, you in, are you in agreement or do you think there is actually more that the government can do? Are you directing that question to somebody specifically? To Ken Lin. Oh, to Ken Lin. Sorry, I'm not sure if you oh, heard me. Perfect. Um, I think just going back to your initial question, you need to um, consider more importantly, not what government can do, but what are the needs of entrepreneurs out there? Um, in my decade of experience, I've always found that entrepreneurs always answer to, with two things when it comes to what they need. They need access to funding, number one, and they need access to new markets. And it brings me back to my previous point about the trust relationship. You need government to put together incentives to actually guide them, uh, corporates in wanting to work with um, entrepreneurs that are starting out. Um, there, in my opinion, there are instruments out there. Government has put this forth. It's just the execution needs a lot more refining um, and it needs buy-in from the entrepreneurs and also from corporate South Africa before we can actually make that a success. One of the important tools that we do have is the triple B e-codes. They encourage corporates to actually engage with a financial impact to, the, to corporates if they don't comply. So that helps um, entrepreneurs being able to actually access new markets and then gain access to funding instruments via the triple B e-codes. So overall, my answer is the instruments do exist, but you need buying from the entrepreneurs and you need buying from corporate South Africa and you need refinement of that specific tools to actually um, stimulate the market. Yeah. I like that you, you, you mentioned the triple B, um, you know, code and policy, because I think it does bring me to the next sort of chapter or, or segment of this conversation. We have two women entrepreneurs in our panel um, and we could talk for a long time about especially black women and some of the challenges that are unique to particularly black women entrepreneurs in the continent and I think it was in August last year that um, SME South Africa initiated the breaking the funding glass ceiling series which sought to unpack um, the funding challenges um, women entrepreneurs continue to face um, you know as women in the space um, and, and I just want to ask um, to both of you Titi and um, Boitimelo as women in the SME space, have you experienced um, the funding glass ceiling um, or any kind of glass ceiling actually that has that you felt like if you weren't a woman, it, it would have accelerated that part of that, that facet of your business? You can start to wait a minute. I think for me, in terms of the measures that uh, were put in place as to intervene the challenges that we're having, for example, the triple BEE as mentioned, I think there, for me, the challenge has been the companies that actually want to partner with you, the transferal of skill 
is not clearly articulated or is there is no strategy on how they're going to transfer the skill to your business. So the, B, the triple BEE compliance from the company's perspective is just done as a tick box. We tick, we, we have this woman, then we can tick the box of compliance. And from the ESD element, the challenge has been that even if they do come on board and they give you a, an opportunity to partner, is not in most cases, it hasn't been long-term to sustain me beyond three to five years. So I think instead of being just being a tick box, it should be um, restructured to say the type of business that you have partnered with, is it sustainable beyond five years? Because what is the point of partnering with me for three years, five years, and then in five years, I've closed all my doors and I have dismissed all my employees. So, so that has been the challenge. And I think the other challenge has been access to network. It's such a, you find such a closed, um, it's like a closed cabal, if I were to use a better word. Closed relationship have been formed. So for you to penetrate that barrier is quite difficult. It's who you know, which, should, which shouldn't be. I think everybody should have the opportunity but as an entrepreneur, I guess you really have to check your networks and your alliances. But it's it's it's, it's really not easy. And um, I think that one thing that has put me off as a woman is the is the sexual um, kind of advancements that come with I need help and what can you do for me. It has kind of put me off because I know I've got a lot more to offer. So I would kind of just, you know, if I come across something like that, I would cut off the relationship immediately. But then not knowing that should have I've explored it, maybe with a different strategy or maybe negotiated better, how far could I have come? So gender-based violence applies, is applicable in all areas as women. So those are issues that we really need to look at. One last comment uh, with the COVID-19, which I think is an uh, opportunity for government to assist us, is that they had an opportunity to collect a database of, 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 of most SMEs through the COVID relief fund. So that, that database can actually be interpreted to you know, classify the different sectors, where the different businesses are, what the challenges are, and how they can actually reach us. Because I'm thinking there is no communication strategy focused in the healthcare industries looking at an entrepreneur, a woman in the pharmaceutical industry. Where do I get? that information? Is there a campaign or a communication strategy targeted at me? I think Matilda raises quite um, a few very vital points for this conversation. Um, Bob Donashalila has raised his hand. Um, you may um, contribute, Bob Donashalila. Thanks, thanks for your, uh, before you go to the next question, <laughs> uh, I thought that just maybe latch on what the colleagues have just said. Uh, and I agree 100% with Kendlin. When, when he says there's, there's quite a lot in terms of the programs out there, the challenge is execution, you know, and an and execution in, in, in my book, we, we need partnerships to do this thing. You know, as, as government, we can put together what we can put together. Private sector can do the same thing. Entrepreneurs, we also need, because one of the challenges that we have seen is that there is no, uh, when I say no, maybe it will be harsh, but we don't have a strong voice of entrepreneurs in the country. You know, where you can then say, um, if I use an example of what, of chambers as an example, if we can have a vibrant chamber movement, whereby you know that as entrepreneurs, you know, you have that voice, that when you talk about partnerships with government and private sector, you don't talk to individual entrepreneurs because that for now it seems it's something like that you know we we need a, a voice of small businesses where you can then say we've got a, vo a strong uh, voice like i said for, for 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 smmes when you talk execution as kendon was saying and you talk partnerships where do we, who do you go to so we need we need to to get something like that government has got that I mean, government is government, is easy to point at government, private sector is private sector, is easy to identify. But in terms of entrepreneurs, I think we, we're still struggling there where we can then say, let's put together something that can say, it's a voice of small business. And, and the, the issues that challenge small business in terms of lobby, we know exactly where to talk to when it comes to things like those. 
the, the, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, that prompted me to raise my hand actually is what we together were saying, that government should have put together a database uh, when we were um, uh, 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 implementing the, the COVID uh, facilities. We actually have. There is a database that the Department of Small Business Development has developed. So that database is doing exactly that. You know, you go and, and, and register. If you go on a DSVD website, you can register on a database because we saw that opportunity. When people apply for COVID relief funds, you then start developing a database and that database says, what is it that businesses are looking for? Because some of the businesses are not looking for funding. Some are looking maybe to for compliance issues, some are looking for access to markets, some is about capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So I, that's how I wanted to just put that a, a database is just there. Just visit the DSBD website you'll be able to register on, 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 on a database. The, the last point that I wanted to make uh, when you, you, you actually mentioned the issues around um, triple B, I said maybe, I mean, this is my, 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 my take on this. It's not about private sector ticking boxes and putting money in there. I think we need to start saying that let's measure the outcomes of what that money and those interventions are doing. Because the issue around that now is about skills development, it's about training, it's about budgets, it's about money. But maybe at some point we then need to say, if I'm running an SD program, you know, I can put whatever amount of money I'm putting, I can put whatever interventions I'm putting. But three years down the line, that should be the measure. What can you point out? As a, it must be an outcome-based thing than just input where you just put budget and put interventions by your training. Then then point to us to say. How many SMMEs sustainable have that those programs created? I think that that that, that I thought I should put that as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mashalela. I do think I think you are in agreement with what um else going to be is saying. I think she's saying that the problem so far is that what it comes across as it's that there's a lot of ticking of boxes and not what you are saying in terms of this transfer of skill. So women get into the spaces, black women are allowed into the spaces, but there's no transfer of, of skill, there's no longevity within those relationships, and therefore it sort of impairs outcomes. So there isn't really a result. Um, I think that's where the issue is, and I, and I think I like what you're saying, that maybe going forward, that should be something that should be explored by private sector in terms of transferring those skills and creating a much more... Um, sustainable relationships with these candidates, um, with these women that are coming into these spaces and, uh, you know, being allowed to be there as opposed to being paraded, um, you know, as it were, um, rather to actually use them for the skills that they're coming in with and also uh, make sure that there's also something that they're getting from the experience within that space. I think that that's where that sentiment was coming from. Um, and you, Titi, going back to breaking the funding glass ceiling, um, I know you also are sort of in a very male domain space, the tech world is quite male dominated. Um, have you experienced those challenges that, um, you know, most women are saying, um, look, we are having this, we're having to fight an extra fight because of our gender? Um, definitely. I mean, in tech, um, it's, it's one of those fields where it's, it's amazing if you're in a part of a company or, or something like that where you're a black woman because, you know, you're a minority and all of that stuff. But a lot of times, you know, it's celebrated like that, but you're not taken as seriously. I mean, we must have to prove ourselves twice to say, you know, I am capable. Actually, I have studied for this. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm qualified. Um, it's almost like at first glance, people don't necessarily believe in the skill or whatever you bring into the table and you have something to prove. So that's one of the challenges that we definitely face in, in tech. I, I think one of the things to really, that that's one difficult challenge. I think one of the things that need to be looked at is to actually um, empower more women to actually come into tech because there really isn't enough women in technology. So I think that's part of it. Um, there isn't a lot of women that are showing that they are capable of it. So that's what it's one of those challenges. And yet, if you actually look at a lot of funding now, a lot of funding goes to technical businesses. Tech, tech businesses do get a lot of funding, but we don't have a lot of women in that, which is maybe why there's also quite a wide gap. Maybe women don't have the skills that are being funded mostly at the moment, or I don't know what, what the solution to that would be, but yeah. I do think that also um, the problem is, and I, I think it was the Sangim Simang who mentioned 
that sometimes there's a quick, the quick answer to go to is that there isn't enough, but there isn't looking. Because the question can also be, are, are entities looking at the right places for women who are, who do have the skills? Um, you know, we have a lot of coding, uh, um, you know, programs that are, are sort of, you know, emerging in the country and particularly coding for women. Um, are those relationships between the tech companies being fostered between these coding programs and these coding academies, particularly for women? So I think that's another question that we can think about that um, as opposed to saying there isn't, are we actually approaching it with, are we looking or are we just assuming that there isn't um, the working force. I'm going to take it back to um, Ken Lin and um, Don Mashelele and ask, we've spoken about, you know, you know, limited to uh, um, finances and limited um, networks for, for women in the space. How do we undo such gendered issues within the SME space? Ken Lin? Wow, wow. you just gave me a heavy one, eh? <laughs> um, in all honesty, though, um, it takes me back to what I've been mentioning. It's a common trend that we, as a country, we need to be very deliberate about developing entrepreneurs firstly. Then also we have to recognize that women are in a minority position within this space. And I think it was Boyd Miller that mentioned that it's when you're um, trying to break through certain barriers, you're trying to actually access those networks that it is a closed off space. It is people that know each other that been that have been doing business with one another forever that don't want to necessarily allow a newbie to step in and get access to those opportunities. Um, that's why I do believe that government has put together some instruments to assist in that. There is benefits out there to assist women specifically. There is a economic benefit for corporates to actually engage with female entrepreneurs. The problem is that particular space is not very regulated. Um, each company gets to decide or interpret how they develop women entrepreneurs um, in their, their, the way that they want to, which means that sometimes it may come across as a tick box exercise, but I've had the pleasure of working with multiple entities that work with, or they build these projects with a specific purpose. So if you are a skilled female entrepreneur in this particular field, um, they would bring you in and they'd recognize that you're starting at a start out phase. They would then partner you with industry experts. They will then at the end of the project, look at do you need any funding, uh, coaching, making sure that the business model works itself. Going through that process uh, in itself fits you as an entrepreneur, uh, puts that stamp on you that says, I am viable. I am able to actually bring something to the party. It gets your foot in the door. At that point in time, I think it's up to the entrepreneur to then seal the deal. Um, but I do recognize that uh, the plight of the female entrepreneur tends to be a lot more strenuous than that of the average entrepreneur starting out. I will um, also open up the floor to our audience on Facebook. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask the questions and I'll ask um, my two um, colleagues to help me up with those questions. Um, Babudan Mashalela, we're saying, where do we, how do we get rather to a space where we don't have to have unique um, policies for women? Where, how do we just open and say, come in and just practice on an equal, um, playing field, and there, there's no need for a woman to have special, uh, um, you know, financial, you know, um, aid. They can just um, compete at the same level as men. How do we get to that point? As Candy was saying, it's a tough one, <laughs> uh, because my, my my natural instinct says, if if you've got, and I don't want to just limit this to to women but limits this to what we, we what we call at CIF and other DFIs, we call that priority target groups. So priority target groups, we're talking youth, we're talking women, we're talking people with disabilities, uh, and we're talking uh, businesses and townships. So uh, the, the, those are the priority target, target groups. And the reason we say that is given the history of our country, we know where we're coming from, and uh, there have been a lot of marginalization of those target groups. Um, for us to get them to a point where 
we do what you are asking so that we just open up normal social policies, et cetera, et cetera. We, we need to do something practical before we can get there. But let me maybe talk about what is it that we can do to, to actually get them to, to level the playing fields, if you like, in the that. So um, I think we need proper tangible incentives, you know, with conditions. Um, incentives do attract investment and you need to put proper conditions. I mean, look, look, when you think in terms of what sector can I use as an example, things in terms of the automotive sector, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of factories coming, a lot of uh, companies coming to South Africa to put a factory here and there, because there's a, there's a proper incentive for you to come and do that. And I'm sure government is putting conditions. It's not just building an incentive without a condition. You know, when you come here, you must come and do X, Y, Z, and there must be a condition. So I'm saying we are still not there yet. We still need to have proper incentives to support women entrepreneurs and with the proper conditions. And with that, we need to have tangible support in terms of capacity and so on and so on. The issues around capacity will address um, you know, because it, it must be a business imperative. You know, you, you, you cannot say I'm partnering with a women-owned business because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to, how to, to correct a market failure of some sort. It must be the right thing to do. You know, you must go out there and saying that, you know, it, 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 it's a business imperative for me. It makes business sense to do this. We need to get there. And for us to do that, Amongst other things, is the issues, like I said, the issues of incentives, the issues of capacity, and so on. And so on. But the other thing that uh, I'm thinking, we probably need to start saying, let's say, let's take one sector as, as an example. We start saying that we are going to procure, or it can be a sector, it can be a product. Uh, again, let me use government as an example. One of the levers that government has got is the procurement spend. You know, government buys a lot of goods and services uh, through the preferential, pro I mean, through the procurement spend, the so-called tenders that we do get. So there must be a, a, a we must take a, a conscious decision that says, this type of products we go to procure from women-owned businesses, as an example, and then, and, and, and not be, be apologetic about that. You know, I know the issues around constitutional issues, et cetera, et cetera. We must start dealing with that, but we'll never change the world. We'll never change if we are then saying, um, we and assuming that the, 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 the playing fields are level because they are not. You know, we must start saying that if we are saying issues, uh, this type of commodities, this type of service, technology, whatever it, it is, 10% uh, of that we're going to procure from uh, female entrepreneurs. Let, let's, 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 let's just do that and, and, and go out there and do the pr proper support in terms of funding, in terms of capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So I th and, and unless we, we address those things, unless we, until such time where we level the playing field, we, we are still far, in my, in my opinion, we are still far from a thing that says, uh, there, are no, there are no longer policies for what I, uh, I've, I've said when I started. The priority target groups. We still need those policies because, you know, uh, truth be told, we we, we are not we are not changing. The, the, the pace of change is a bit slow. It's getting there, but it's slow. But we still need to take bold steps for us to 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 come and have policies where we are saying uh, it's, it's it's now everyone for himself. We no longer have policies for women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I see. Kellen, your hand is up. Have a comment. Yeah, I just literally wanted to reiterate um, the points that Don just touched on, specifically to your question of you about how do you get to a place where everyone's on a level playing field. I think for me, we need to first recognize that right now in 2021, we are not all on a level playing field. And we need to work towards getting that to change to a point where we're all on the same playing field. The only way we do that is by recognizing that women, for argument's sake, and black entrepreneurs, disabled entrepreneurs are all playing at different levels. And we need to recognize that and put tools in place to assist them. Um, I know that some of these tools, employment equity, BE, are not 
um, the most popular topics, but they are, I'm a big believer in them, in being able to assist uh, entrepreneurs coming from different backgrounds to be able to reach that level, being able to penetrate into markets, being able to um, gain access to funding. Um, if these um, policies were not in place, we would be in a position where um, even the economic transformation would be even worse than what it is today. So again, I just want to reiterate that um, it's not a level playing field at the moment. And what we need to do is recognize that, utilize the tools in place, but even more so, I feel like those tools need to be refined even more because we're not seeing the change at the pace that we want to see it at this point in time. We do have a few comments um, from our audience, um, not necessarily questions. There's a comment from Sipogazi Jojo, who is saying that I agree with Kenlin that one, we as a country need to be deliberate about promoting entrepreneurs and two, women are at a disadvantage at the moment in the business world. There's also um, another comment from Ayabonga, Kwebulana, who is saying that, um, yes, the funders, they have to make sure that, um, I guess, businesses are going to use the money um, wisely. I want to sort of rewind and take it back to, um, again, talking about financing for small businesses. And, and I think this one is for you, particularly, Kenlin, as you, as you sort of I, I think it was last year when we had a masterclass with you on, on tax, particularly for small businesses. And I, and I think I do want to ask these questions before we wrap, before we wrap up. Um, again, for small businesses, where, where if I have a business right now and I want to learn more about small business tax, um, what's the first step? How does taxing look like for small business in, in South Africa? And I think I'm actually after you because I just want an expert view, and I think I might open it up to the rest of our panelists and just ask what has been some of their relationships, um, you know, with small business takes. And I think lastly, Bobu Don Michelle can come in just from them again from a, from a government entity space to just say or maybe reiterate um, the importance of um, you know um, taxing for small businesses and them understanding that. A mouthful of a question, but I'm going to start with you, Ken Lin, um, from an expert view as someone who's worked in the space. Um, you know, what? How does that look like for a small business right now? Um, for me, uh, the number one advice I give to every uh, business that's starting out is, if you can, partner up immediately with an accountant or bookkeeper that knows what they're doing. And not for the specific uh, need of pushing them your receipts, having them do your books, but it's having that relationship and being able to actually consult with them on a regular basis as to why do I need this? And if I need to register for that, um, what's the benefit to my business? Because I think so many times with entrepreneurs, they know they need a tax clearance certificate. Um, they want to become a vendor with a big corporate entity and the vendor's telling them we need you to be a VAT vendor. They go out, they rush to register. Um, all of these elements have different impacts. You need to know exactly what you're signing up for. You need to know the purpose of everything. So when a corporate entity asks you, um, where's your tax clearance certificate? Why are they asking you for that? That is an independent document that shows that yes, you've paid your taxes. Yes, you've submitted um, your returns, but it also says that this business is likely not to fail within the next year because they are compliant with um, the, uh, the laws as it pertains to tax. Um, it means that the business is more than likely in a solid position. And so if me as a corporate entity, and I want to do business with you, that document tells me um, there's a good chance that I could um, have a long-term relationship with you. Each and every document speaks into a business specific purpose. The only person that can walk that walk with you will be your accountant being able to advise you clearly. I wanna add one last thing in there. Um, I come from the enterprise development space. I do advise every entrepreneur to try and join an incubator, whether it's specific to your industry or not, um, join an in incubator to gain access to free business coaching, finance coaching, training, um, back office accounting support. These are all elements that are non-cash elements, but they all, needed and these things count towards you will learn so so much in order to get you to the space where you become fund funder ready um during that process so that is my advice that i would give to any entrepreneur at this point in time um, 
Um, and you, Moji Melo, from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, I think Kendall has given us, you know, the expert view, but from your side, as someone who's been running a very successful business, um, how is your relationship with, um, you know, takes for small, well, for small to, uh, you know, bigger enterprise has been for you? How is that, or at least how has that looked like for you? Uh, look, I think because that service I outsource to a professional, but um, as a business owner, you just need to understand the basics. And for me, the biggest lesson has been, how do I legally structure my entity? Am I going to be a sole proprietor? Am I going to be a PTY? Am I going to transact using a trust? And what are the implications? And that's what Ken Len in, 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 in has articulated to say, you need to know what are the implications. Um, the implications of that, which could have I mean, significant cash uh, impact on your cash flow, planning processes that needs to be in place. However, I do appreciate the, uh, I think, the government in terms of coming on board or the relief measures, especially during COVID, to assist small, medium uh, enterprises, um, the tax reliefs, the COVID-19 um, findings that we have seen. There's been a lot of initiatives. And I guess for us, it's, it, it, the, it was we're just overwhelmed because you have to keep operations going and also keep up with everything that is going on. But um, I do appreciate it and I also think at this point, I do understand why the Department of Small Business and Development was established in 2015. I understand its objective because the minister has articulated the four objectives that they're working towards. And I can already see the four objectives that they're working towards, uh, also offering solutions in my business. For instance, she's talking about policy and planning. She was just reviewing all the legislative measures that we need to look at to ensure that we empower SMEs equitable access um, um, for growth, and also um, sound corporate governance, which is being reviewed, and, and um, contribution to the social economic challenges that we have. So um, overall, I, I think that we are going somewhere, and I appreciate uh, all the efforts that are coming, even from the different agencies, the CIPA, CEDAS, I think people are on board and people are willing to lend you an extra ear. Um, there is a question for you, Babutan Mashe, before you get into this question. Um, there's a question from Facebook that from Sipogazi, Georgia, again, asking, um, wouldn't setting a standard um, to procure certain products only um, for women perpetuate the stereotype that women belong only in certain industries? As women, we want to be recognized in all industries because we have, we have what it takes to participate everywhere. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. I actually saw that now. <laughs> so I think what I was saying, it's not to have industry specifics. What I was saying is that let's open up the market. But when we open up the market, let's make sure that we don't, because we are still not there uh, when it comes to the issue of leveling the playing fields. Let's make sure that some of the opportunities deliberately we channel them in, 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 in a manner that is, that is support, et cetera, et cetera. We channel them to the priority target groups I was talking about. So what I'm saying, I'm not singling out any, I was just using maybe that as an example. We are not singling out any industry, but we are saying that if there are opportunities, let's talk about what now, infrastructure as an example. You know, if, if we're talking about infrastructure, we need to then make sure that, uh, in, 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 in a tangible way, certain opportunities have to go to those groups that were previously marginalized. And uh, uh, understand me, it's more, it's, it's not talking about a specific industry. We are saying now, we can not open up the market and then say it's free for all, because people are not at the same level when it, 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 it talks, I mean, when it comes to capacity, it comes to readiness and all of those things, uh, it's not, uh, and I must emphasize, it's not talking about any industry. It's opening up the market. But once you open up the market, let's make sure that you know a certain slice of that market. We support the previously the, the the priority groups that I was talking about. We support them to take advantage of those markets. And it's across industries. It's not specific to any industry. Thank you for that. And for the text question with um, SMEs. 
particularly now from a from a business from a government perspective um what would you say um is sort of uh, uh what what does that look like for small businesses um to medium businesses in the country at the moment or at least advice from the government perspective yeah i, I think i will let on what Kelly was saying to say you know when you go into business partner with a, someone who can do your books in terms of tech and etc etc et et because as an entrepreneur you don't know what you don't know but you're just an entrepreneur you go out there do what you like doing passion and so on and so on so get an, um, an expert advice, uh, and I won't repeat what Kendall has said, just put it so well. But the, the, the other thing really is also to understand the exemptions. Remember to stimulate the, the space of entrepreneurship as government. There are certain tax exemptions, uh, more like incentives that the government is putting for, 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 for entrepreneurs. You know, I'm no longer talking now about the COVID relief schemes, uh, even outside of COVID, even pre-COVID, you know, there were exemptions that as an SMME, uh, people, um, you know, they can qualify for those type of exemptions. So understand those, uh, because one thing people, when you talk about uh, registering for tax or registering with SARS, et cetera, et cetera, people still think in terms of paying tax, you know, and then that's why you have issues around tax evasions and so on and so on. So around issues of compliance, understand exactly what are the things um, what are the exemptions, what are the incentives, tax incentives that government is putting together uh, or has put together to stimulate the growth of SMMEs. And again, on to Kendall's point, if you partner with the right tax practitioner, they'll be able to provide you that support. Thank you for that, Shalila. Um, by way of closing and wrapping up our our um, discussion for today. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to just leave us with uh, last words or advice for small businesses that are upcoming that want to participate um, in the landscape but are still trying to figure out the financial aspect of things, the networking um, you know, side of things and just how to run the entity as a whole. I will say that also um, Sissy did excuse herself as to she has um, she had engagements, um, so she has excused herself from the panel, but just with um, Boitimelo, Babu Don Mashele, and Kenlin, um, just those last words before we close. You can start, Boitimelo, please. Okay. My last words would be that we, I mean, there are opportunities that we need to strengthen the local web chain. I think we must not lose that opportunity that the local web chain needs to be strengthened. For instance, in my sector, local manufacturing of drugs um, so that we are self-reliant and we were exposed during COVID. And from a personal uh, perspective, I just want to say um, the three colors that, you know, pillars that sustain me individually is itself. Um, you know, you need to articulate your vision so well and understand yourself so well that you are not shaken by anything. Uh, when the millions come, your personality doesn't change. When your bank balance is zero, you're also not shaken to, to, you know, to, to just give up. The second thing is that is skills. Empower yourself with information. Platforms like this, you know, and, and ensure that you get yourself in platforms that empower your knowledge. Uh, we just highlighted the text one, which is important. It's basic information that you need as a business uh, person. And then the third element is support. Um, I think I need support from all levels, from a family perspective, who supported me initially when I started, uh, spiritual support, emotional support, financing support. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's holistic. You can't just look at yourself as, as, as yeah, you're this entrepreneur. It, it's holistic. You have to look at yourself holistically and allow yourself to grow. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an enjoyable journey. It's a fulfilling journey. Um, but it's a good feeling to wake up and say, this is what I was born to do, and that's what drives me. And you, Babu Dan Mashele? Uh, thanks, thanks, a few. I mean, for me, I'll say, as an entrepreneur, you know, they, they normally say, sell the problem you solve, not the product. You know, identify a problem in the community, and then you find a solution for that particular problem. Uh, it's a sustainable solution and you can commercialize the solution. Then you have a business. So uh, I think most, more, more often than not, people come and say, I'm selling this particular product or I'm providing this particular.
the service, it becomes difficult to push it in the market. If you have developed something, you go out there and then you want to sell it because you think people will need that. So I'm saying an underlying sell the problem that you solve uh, and then identify that. And then once you can uh, find a solution for that, for that particular problem, you commercialize and then you have a problem. The, the other thing that I want to say, and I think it's prompted by what uh, was saying, there is what in business is called a sweet spot. As an entrepreneur, one thing is you need to identify your passion. You know, what do you love doing? Because it can be because it makes money, et cetera, et cetera. The money will come, but identify your passion. What is it that you love to do? It doesn't feel like a job, doesn't feel like work because it's your passion. So I think let's soul search and say, okay, what is my passion? So that is the one thing. The other thing is about, are you talented to do that particular passion or to live that passion? You know, what are you good at? Do you have a, good, a God-given talent for you to live your passion? So again, it's a soul searching thing to say, I'm passionate about this, but do I have a talent? Did God give me that talent to, to be good at that particular passion? And the last one is, does it pay well? Because if you can combine all those three questions into one, and then you're saying, can you develop a business model from your passion and your talent? Then you have a business. So I think for me, those will be my parting uh, words appealing to say, sell the problem that you solve with the product. Again, find a sweet spot in terms of your passion, your talent, and develop a business model out of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you, Kevin, lastly? Yeah, I think for me, um, I'm going to focus on the finance side because I feel like our other speakers have touched on entrepreneurship um, as a whole. Um, for me, again, like I mentioned, that two of the elements um, that entrepreneurs are seeking out are uh, access to funding and access to new networks. Now, as a startup, um, most startups are focused on where do I get funding? Where do I get funding? It's a very difficult space to be in. I would say focus on refining your business model first before looking for funding. Um, you are going to want to, because every entrepreneur has their skill set, what they want to, the area that they want to focus on. What you really need more than anything else is the business support to come along with that, being able to sell your business on paper. Because if I'm going out and I'm trying to access a government contract, I'm trying to access a corporate contract. I need to be able to put a represent my business well on paper by having all the documentation that's needed, um, all the relevant um, documentation to show that you are an active business that is a, a responsible um, corporate citizen. You want all of those documents in place. So when you are able to actually get the meeting that you are hoping to get, you are able to step in there and conclude it because the last thing you want is your business to be held back by red tape. And I guarantee you, whether you go to government, where you go to corporate South Africa, red tape is gonna follow you everywhere. The last thing you want is to miss out on an opportunity um, just because you didn't submit one return. Um, so I would say that as, uh, as a nation, we need to start focusing on our requirements as a legal entity, because so many times when you register a business, um, entrepreneurs get, get it confused that the entrepreneur and the business is one and the same. These are two different entities. You need to treat them as such because your business is a legal entity on its own and it needs to grow and develop and have a profile of sorts over time. So that's what I would say would be the focus areas for me if you are an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, that's me. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, on that very insightful note, I am going to close our conversation for today. If you want to look for uh, more of these conversations or more um, insightful um, material, you can please um, just follow our pages. It's um, Digify Africa on Twitter and Digify Africa on Facebook as well. That's where we post most of our information about, you know, different um, small um, enterprises and also just information that speaks to small businesses and a small um, business landscape in South Africa. A big thank you to my panel and a good afternoon going forward. And thank you to you at home for joining me. Goodbye.